Okay, uh, people, I'm, I'm starting myself, which is, which is how it should be. Um, okay, right in the room. Okay, uh, the talk is Data Visualization with Python and JavaScript. And um, it's sort of roughly based around a book I'm currently working on, which should be in the shops in a few months. Uh, I guess about three years ago, I made the conscious decision to try and become a bit of a specialist uh, because then eventually you become a guru and then you just have to turn up and they pay you, which seems like a good ambition uh, and generally it's not appreciated in our culture. So uh, I was an academic for a long time. I did a lot of visualization work. I've done a lot of simulations and everything else and I thought it was an interesting area. It's also a very exciting area right now for lots of reasons. Um, and when you do a book, uh, your, your nice editor, all my editors are very nice, they ask you awkward questions like, why are you writing this book? Um, and what are your pain points? So pain points are those itches that you want to scratch, um, things that have sort of hurt you in the past and hopefully have hurt other people. And one of them, certainly for me, is that I've crafted so many Python GUIs in my time using WX Python, PyQt, various GL forms, and they're brilliant, but you'll have to take my word for it because I am never going to distribute them because it's just too much of a pain. Uh, if I had written them for the web, for example, I could just give you a URL. Um, and uh, when I was doing it, that wasn't available. And even now, I think a lot of people don't appreciate exactly what you can do. But uh, the question is, how do I join that web party? There are some fantastic Python initiatives here uh, that many of you will have heard of, Bokeh, Plotly, Vega, they're very clever. There's some very clever programming going on. Um, but uh, there is a sort of a, an elephant in the living room, if you will. Uh, they're doing transpiling. They're converting one language into another language, and that's just usually horrible. Uh, you wouldn't want to, uh, to, to have to debug Python that had been computer generated. Um, so uh, why? Well, because JavaScript's awful, right? It's, it's a horrible language. It's not true. Um, and it's the only game in town, that's the point. Uh, in many ways, there's no competition uh, involved. There's no kind of fanboyism or worry about that because uh, you can't use any other language. Um, so you've got to come to terms with it, no matter what you feel. Uh, if it were 10 times worse, I would say there might be a case for always sort of uh, trans uh, uh, converting other code into it, but it isn't 10 times worse. It's actually quite quite good. I didn't think I'd find myself saying that 10 years ago. Uh, and it's getting better all the time. It can do some interesting things. It's got, you know, uh, it's got sort of map reduce. Uh, it's got um, functional programming um, uh, that is much easier than Python's form. Uh, lambdas, yes. And uh, you can uh, do here like a, a filter map reduce operation on an array. Uh, those are all uh, methods on uh, arrays, first class. And when you get, and I'm just using anonymous functions here just to sort of drive that through. When you get used to programming like this, you, you come back to Python sometimes and you, you find yourself sort of missing things, uh, which is surprising, but there you go. Um, it smokes Python for speed. Most people don't know this. There's been a huge arms race uh, going on in the JavaScript world, and uh, it destroys Python on pretty much all benchmarks now. Um, it, sometimes I feel like a kid in the playground because I've got so much cpu uh, It's increased something like three orders of magnitude uh, in, in 10 years. That's just insane. Um, and a little cheat sheet will get you from one language to the other. They're, they're not that different. You know, I, I love Python. I love the fact that it's white-spaced. I love all of the readability. But um, it's, they both come from a, a similar background, and they, they have conditionals and loops and the rest of it. But also syntax is, um, isn't the issue, actually. Uh, after a while, it's, it's not really important. Um, I know we all love Pythons, and I think Pythons is better in many ways. But it's actually about idioms more than anything else. It's about, uh, in, the, in the world of visualization on, on the browser, it's about functional versus um, uh, declarative, uh, functional and declarative programming, less sort of imperative procedural. Uh, that's a bigger deal, actually, than the language, increasingly. So if you use a library like D3, your main overhead, the main kind of thing you're going to worry about is just ab absorbing the idioms of it rather than, rather than worrying that it's in JavaScript. Uh, so Python JavaScript should be a fantastic complement. Uh, Python has this amazing data processing stack that's getting better all the time. 
Um, and JavaScript is just there. <laughs> so uh, if you want to put your stuff on the web, which everyone does, because every, I mean, all visualizations want to live on the web. Ultimately, that's, that's what they want to do when they grow up. Um, so what's the problem? I mean, why aren't more people, I guess, co-coding, if you like? I, I, meet, I meet quite a few, but there, I think there should be more. Uh, I think a lot of it is there, there is this sense that web development is this horrible, crudgy, crafty mess. Uh, and there's a lot to that. Uh, it suffers uh, d from horrible toolitis. Everyone wants to know what IDE to use when, when they first sort of question me about a lot of this stuff. You don't need an IDE, you need a text editor. Uh, what about SAS and Crass and Gulp and Grunt? And uh, it, it's, it's, none of it's necessary at all. I wouldn't even think about using it for the first year or two of your explorations. And even after then, I probably wouldn't because quite often they actually don't save any time. You spend so much time sort of trying to get them to work. Um, so this is actually closer to, I think, the truth, and then what will be the truth. Uh, uh, a thin little membrane between the web, which is, I guess, representing JavaScript programming for it, uh, and Python. Um, and the, the language of transfer is JSON, which is a very, very nice little uh, language compared with many. Um, Python works fantastically with it. JavaScript is built around it, so um, that's a perfect complement. Um, and I would propose a kind of a lightweight shim, so a small HTML skeleton, JavaScript uh, object uh, notation as the language, a little RESTful API in five lines to just deliver the data, and people are calling these things sort of one-page apps or whatever you will. Um, for this talk, I thought I would, I would, you know, I'm a data visualizer, so I should do a, a visualization, and, and I didn't have much time, so this is it, but I'm quite proud of it. it it's arranged its data in a very easy to absorb form. Um, and no, I was, you know, this, it took mankind hundreds of years to work out to put things in rows and columns. Um, this was one of the prototypes. Uh, it's slightly harder to see the, the patterns in that. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's other ways that you could present the data, right? Um, now, I kind of did this. I, I thought I'd do this for the fun. This, this took about, I guess, and I'm no Uber coder. I know Mike Bostock, the creator of D3, but maybe 15 minutes from thinking about it and doing it uh, because it's programming, and that's what programming is empowering. You know, I just thought, I'll do a data sketch. I have a little bit of data. I'll have a bit of fun. Um, now, I assume you'll let me go. That's all the web dev. I mean, the, I guess the, the, the horrible, crappy ooh, HTML, CSS. Uh, modern HTML5, you don't have to have all this, all this horrible block code in front and back and headers and tails. This is it. This is a completely valid modern uh, HTML5 page. You've got a bit of style. I didn't style it, as you could tell, very carefully. But these are a few placeholders. And there, I just import some JavaScript, um, which is there. I won't go into it now, but it's, you can probably recognize programming when you see it, right? Uh, and I, the Python implementation wouldn't look a lot different, except for a few vars and a semicolon and, you know, okay, curly blocks. And it, it, it's not very important, really. It's more important to be able to program. Uh, so I thought, I mean, I did that to, to, to make the point of transformation. All, all data visualizations about transforming your data. Some transformations work, some of them work, don't work at all, some of them work better than others. Um, so I thought as a, a sort of way to get the book going, I would pose a problem, which would be to transform a Wikipedia page. Here you go. This is a list of Nobel laureates by country. As you can see, the, the data's all there. Um, we can fold down and we can go, ah, oh, Carbon Frisch. I had to write papers about this man once. Um, there's Carbon Frisch, and then we can, we can go back, I guess, and pause, and then we... Um, and convert it into a visualization. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, the contrast is bad. There is actually a map around about here, but this is not big brightness problems. Um, the idea was to, to take all the data in the, in the Nobel Prize page and all the pages leading off it, scrape it all, uh, and turn it into something a bit more kind of usable and, um, uh, I guess, clickable and which enable you to just explore. And the book is about showing you how to build this and all the kind of stages in between. Um, so, so what you first have to do is scrape the data. You don't have to scrape the data. You could get 
lovely clean data from somewhere. If you find out where, please send me an email. I'd love to know. Um, because most data is, is not clean. Uh, I think that point's been made a lot during this conference. So the idea was to scrape the data from Wikipedia. Uh, this would give an opportunity to demonstrate Scrapey, which is this fantastic Python library, which is industrial standard scraper. Um, you use, you can use, a, maybe I'd probably use a modern browser to kind of find, you probably can't quite see here, but these are, in fact, this contrast and this is all weird. Um, but there are arrows pointing to important things that I can see and you can't. Um, you'll have to take my word for it. But you use Scrapey to find the, uh, the elements in the page that you want. You turn them into what's called next path. You put that into, into Scrapey. And then you create a, what's called a spider. You send that in. You have a little pipeline if you want to deal with images. Um, so in this case, I'm grabbing all the little mini bios of all the Nobel Prize winners. I'm grabbing all their, image, uh, all their images, if they are there. Uh, and at the end of it, Scrapey spews out a, uh, a nice uh, array of JSON objects. Um, it's very, very adaptable. It's fantastically powerful. It's a very nice tool, but, but it can also be used in a fairly kind of modest way uh, without having to uh, get too much brain damage. So I'd thoroughly recommend it. Uh, the data will be dirty. I think I've probably mentioned that before. I will mention it again. Uh, data is dirty. All data is, you'll probably spend, if you do data visualization, 50% of your time at least cleaning dirty data. Um, it's one of those, I guess it's a, I mean, it's a dirty secret, right? But it's, uh, it's, it's just the fact of, of the, the beast. Um, and if you want to clean data, uh, certainly you know, modest size, reasonable size data sets, there's this tool called Pandas, which is the Python uh, library, which is wonderful for that. It's tailor-built for taking sort of row column the data and um, cleaning it. You load your data frame into Pandas. You uh, I guess you do a few little preliminary things to get a feel for it. Uh, you quiz it for missing data fields. As you can see here, there are some, some missing ones. Um, so this is what's, what was scraped. And there are missing dates of birth. There are missing gender fields. There are some problems in this data set. Uh, data cleaning isn't particularly interesting. But this is, a, this is a fun one. This is about three lines of, of pandas to Try and find the dodgy dates uh, in, in the Wikipedia. Wikipedia, of course, is manually edited, so it's already, it's already a, a mine of dirty data. Uh, I think here we have what's, what philosophers call a category error. So Johannes Dietrich van der Waals' date of death is Diederik Kortvig. Uh, so something's gone wrong there. Uh, someone's date of death is living. Um, this is what happens when human beings are allowed to enter data into machines. Uh, but Pandas lets you quickly find it and hopefully uh, remove the worst stains. So the original data set, you hack around with it, which I'll explain in the book, and you end up with, uh, it certainly won't be perfect, pristine, clean data, but it'll be a lot cleaner. Um, I think the point was made today in, in Ian's talk that uh, clean data is, uh, no matter what the work involved, uh, it pays back tenfold, hundredfold in the end, because working with data, dirty data will just bite you. And that's, that works with visualization and everything else. If you go. So Pandas is, is a great tool to have here. Um, you then use, this is more, in, uh, more, more fun, is exploring the data, trying to find stuff that you want to communicate. And, and it's, whatever you're already doing, even if you're trying to explain to your boss how a certain set of, of you know, financial transactions as it works. You're telling a story because we're, we're hominids, we're, we're humans, we like stories, and everything else just bores us, we turn off. So you're looking for narratives, you're looking for little sort of nuggets in the, in the data, you're mining it for, for, for stories. Um, so one story about the uh, one-liner in, in, um, in Pandas, it's not particularly interesting, but yes, the United States of America has won loads more prizes than anyone else. There's a, there's a, a shock. Um, but you can do more interesting stuff than that. You can look at here's regions. So I've broken the world into the uh, North American region, the Asian region, the European, and in a few lines of pandas, you can get a graph up that shows some trends. And as you can see here, this blue line is America, uh, post-war, massive investment in, in, in science after Los Alamos and the bomb, and woof, they pass the, uh, the Europeans, uh, France, England, and uh, uh, Germany in around about the early 80s, and then they're, they're moving up. So there's a story to tell there. There's a historical story. Uh, the biggest story probably of the whole Nobel Prize here. Uh, 
gender disparity. Look at that, a few lines of pandas. Um, <laughs> the green, yes, the green columns are men and the blue ones are, are women. And uh, as you can see, there's a huge difference there, particularly in the sciences. Uh, you can do with a few lines. You can use Seaborn, it's a lovely extension to pandas and has some, well, it looks pretty for a start, but it also has some very nice little built-in plots. Here's a distribution plot with uh, a kernel um, density estimate. And this shows you that uh, the rough age at which Nobel Prizes are distributed. If you're still under 60, you're in with a shot, even now. If, if you're over 90, it's not gonna happen. And if you're under 20, uh, still waiting on that one. There has been an under 20 Nobel Prize winner, but not physics. Uh, distribution of life expectancy, they live a long time, Nobel Prize winners. This is a, a violin plot, which is kind of an extension on a box, uh, box plot that Seaborn has. So it gives you a nice, the kernel density estimate, and it gives you distributions. It's uh, all in one go. It's very pretty. But you can see here, they live, yeah, to, to their 80s, 90s, even the hundreds. Um, now, there is, a, uh, there is a kind of, a, uh, there is a possible reason of this. You, they, they, if they're not getting Nobel Prizes until they're 60, then, of course, you're filtering out all the people who die prematurely, so that's going to bias the figures. But they're still, even allowing for that, it turns out they live a long time. Um, and you can do something else here. The, the Seaborn gives you a nice little um, line plot here, so it does a bit of line fitting on the data with a confidence interval, and this is mapping their uh, life expectancy with their date of birth. And as you can see, people are living longer, Nobel Prize winners included. But that's just a few lines of Python to tell another little story. This one I quite like, it's uh, the Nobel, Nobel diaspora. In, in, because it's Wikipedia, what you find pe people entering Nobel Prize winners by their nationality at birth, rather than the nationality at which they won the prize, because there's a lot of you know, national pride at stake. But technically, the nationality when you win the prize is, is, is what goes in the book. Uh, but you can take the nationality at birth and the nationality at when they win the prize, and you can plot them against each other to form a heat plot, which you'll be able to see if the contrast on this worked. Um, and what this shows, this sort of peak here, is uh, a huge influx into America uh, and the uh, United Kingdom, slightly less so, but um, from Germany and Austria and Italy. And if you look behind the scenes, this is the, these are the predominantly Jewish scientists who were leaving um, Nazi Germany in the 30s and, and fascist Italy in the 30s and, and, and the 40s. And um, there's a story in a few lines of, of, of Python. This, is, uh, this was a, a huge efflux from Europe, uh, and of course it seeded the American science program, which is responsible for some of the distributions that we see there. So uh, Europe basically lost a huge number of great scientists. Um, so after you've explored it, you, you want to imagine a visualization. I figured you know, the most important thing about Nobel Prizes is that the prizes themselves, they're the stars. So you put them at the top, each one of them should have a each one of them has an icon because they're all equal in my eyes. And you have a little map which you'd be able to see better if the contrast worked here. Have I mentioned that before? Um, and you have a graph which will give you basic metrics and you have a way in which you can explore uh, the, the individuals. Um, so you've got, in, you've got in mind how to build your, what data viz you want to build, um, how to deliver the data. Well, the one thing I love about Python is if you were working with R or some other specialized languages, um, MATLAB, heaven for fen, uh, and someone says, right, I want a server. You've got this great data. I want you to pump this data onto the web, right? That's easy in R or MATLAB. Um, I've never seen a MATLAB web server. Uh, I, I don't want to. If anyone has an example, don't, don't bring it to me, please, because um, I already don't sleep that well. But uh, I've seen an R one, and, and it's, it's not very pretty. And I appreciate R, I'm not trying to start a war. But Python, uh, you just write a few lines of Flask. Flask is my go-to for APIs. Here is, this is using Eve, which is a lovely library that hooks in with MongoDB. Uh, but you can do it almost as easily with uh, an SQL database. Uh, I'm reasonably neutral. I, I, I'll work with any database you, you send to me. But Mongo's nice because it uses what's called bin bison, binary JSON. So it, uh, it works with the language of the web. As I said, I, I'm, I'm getting to the point of standardizing on JSON uh, for, for my data, um, unless I've got a very good reason not to. Uh, so in Eve here, we have uh, a little config script, which basically just tells you what the MongoDB database name is. You write all of four lines, and 
Then you can do a curl test on a RESTful API. You've turned your MongoDB into a, uh, a RESTful API um, in five lines, which is lovely. Um, there's your, and that's your data pipeline, right? That's, you've created your, your, your data in, in with pandas or whatever, and now you know how to feed it through. Um, and at this point, you are gonna receive that data in JavaScript, which is not that hard. Um, and you're gonna use it to build, in this case, a, a visualization, a, a noble visualization. So the data's come in. I'm not gonna cover any of the JavaScript code because um, this one's well, talk is certainly too short. Um, uh, does anyone have any idea how many female physics prize winners there are historically? We've got one here. No, nope, no, it's, it's more than zero. Is any? Twelve is way over. It's two, um, and it's amazing. No one knows, right? And I guess most people could probably guess the first one. Can anyone guess the second? Or we know not guess it. You're never going to guess it. Does anyone know the second? No, no. no. See, this is. No, has her daughter Mary, Mary Curie won too. She won a chemistry, and her daughter won a chemistry as well. But anyway, so this is, uh, let's do one thing, here we go. That's a pretty dramatic change. Um, you know, telling stories, right? Uh, so uh, we filtered it by, f by female gender. And now let's do, uh, filter it by category, shall we? So it's phys, oh, not peace. That gives you, you know, eh. let's, let's, let's do physics, come on. Right, so uh, a woman called Maria Gropert Meyer. Please remember her name. She won the Nobel Prize, and women don't do that very often, so I guess she should be better known. Um, so uh, go and look her up and find out what she did. It was very impressive. Um, and there are the idea, I think, increasing these days is to have visualizations that enable people to find their own stories rather than editorializing for them and telling them everything. Um, and that's, I guess, what a, uh, a good data viz. This is Chrome mummying me. Um, thank you, Chrome. God, I hate Chrome. Go away. Right. Yes, I know I've gone full screen. Thank you. Right. Um, okay. And it was blocking my wall. So there's, a, there's everybody. Um, here we have the, the winners uh, on a, well, let's do, we can do the winners on an absolute basis here. Oof. America, the top. Or we can filter them per capita. Um, and then we find out that, uh, was it, uh, yes, Santa, uh, Santa Lucia, the, the island, has uh, Derek Walcott as a uh, poet, and he skews the figures, but let's do physics. If anyone's from the Netherlands, uh, they win, uh, just about, but it's essentially Scandinavia. So the Scandinavian and Switzerland, if you do a per capita measure of Nobel Prizes, are, are way ahead. Um, so essentially, there's just lots of stories in this uh, visualization, and the idea is that you can find your own. So please do, because it's on the web now. Um, just to remind you, this is what it was. That's how you negotiate your data. Um, and it's taken most of that and just sort of made it, I think, a bit more approachable. That's the idea. This is all the HTML uh, involved. Uh, this is there's a bit of CSS as well, but uh, this isn't a lot more onerous than when I was writing kind of XML kind of tabs or tags for various graphic libraries or GUI libraries. This is just now HTML type. So this, these are the placeholders. Everything else is programming. It's JavaScript. Uh, it's D3. And so you include your scripts in, a, in that uh, index HTML, and you include some libraries that are hanging around on the web, uh, CDN, so you don't even have to have them on your local machine, usually. Um, and that is the lightweight kind of solution to data visualization. So in summary, uh, JSON is, is, the, is, the, is the language, is the, is the data format you should be using to communicate between the two. Uh, Python and JavaScript, I find, are fantastically complementary, but uh, you just have to, you have to acknowledge JavaScript's um, premacy on, on the web. Uh, you don't need a lot of that horrible web dev stuff you've probably heard about. Uh, you can code very light, very, very lightweight, very um, agilely. You can get rid of all the cruft uh, and get the job done. There are some amazing libraries coming out in, 
Um, D3, I would say, is probably could well be the best visualization library per se, uh, but it just happens to be in JavaScript. Um, and I think we're on the cusp now of, of creating new ways to engage with data. We can go beyond, oops, 25 minutes. We can go beyond um, the old, uh, not sometimes a, a bar chart is often the best way you can possibly present your data, but we're in the position now to start just uh, intuitively engaging with our data in, 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 in very interesting ways. We have, we're programmers, we can actually do it programmatically. We don't have to use a library like Tableau or rely on a horrible charting library. We're at a point where we can just program the data uh, and that's, um, that's very powerful. So uh, I'm tweeting on things I find of interest and there's a, a mailing list you can see. So, thank you. Sneak peek, I uh, probably can, uh, whether I should or not. Uh, yeah, uh, well, from that, I guess for that library would be. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, I guess, let's see. We can go back to some code. I'm sure I can expand it. Um, uh, oops, here we go. So I guess. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very intelligently stopping me from being able to zoom because it knows what I really want, which is not to zoom my text. Um, so it's zooming something, but it's not zooming the, the frame at the back. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can go with you later. I guess if you can see anything here, there's vars. Uh, D3 has what's called chaining, is the, is the bigger part of it. Um, if you were coding in D3 in Python, it would look very much the same. It would feel very much the same. Um, you select bits of the DOM and you change their attributes. You add a, uh, in scale of vector graphics, you add a circle here. You give it an attribute, uh, a certain size. You can use uh, style sheets to change its color. Um, it's, yeah, building visualizations really pretty, pretty straightforward. Are there any? Sorry. Um, the visualizations that you had, are they available anywhere? So they are, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they've been incorporated in the talks, so the talk uh, is on the website, and those are in the talks embedded. So, um. uh, so I think the dislike of JavaScript syntax cannot be understated. Um, so I wondered if you had looked into CoffeeScript at all, which is are much similar to Python, and actually, because its compilation process is very light, the debugging is not that much of a problem. I yeah, I, I guess I respectfully disagree. Um, <laughs> I I tried CoffeeScript because obviously it's a little bit Python-esque, and uh, once again, it comes down to the debugging experience. You know, there are map files, but they never work as well as all that. Uh, and what you end up now, because CoffeeScript sort of hasn't taken, you've got a whole lot of examples out there in a language that no one knows. Um, it, it would be justifiable if JavaScript were worse than it is, and, and it, it really isn't. Um, and they are ironing out a lot of the worst aspects of it. Um, so I, I appreciate your dislike, but I, I don't share it. And I think, I think, I think uh, it's, you can get over it quite quickly. There are two or three gotchas that you learn, you don't do again. Um, and uh, with ECMAScript 6, it's fixing a lot of things as well. So it's getting going in the right direction. Uh, it's, it's not really a question. It's just uh, I'd like to disagree with your assertion that JavaScript is not that bad. It really is. It really, really is. No, 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 no. I, it's not. It's become a. It's become a kind of just a very. I think a knee-jerk kind of whipping, whipping dog. And I, I as I said, respectfully disagree. It's uh, just the speed of it. When I go from JavaScript to Python, uh, the I suddenly lose. You know about. 99% of my processing power. That annoys, among other things. But uh, I don't want to get into, into language wars. The point is, <laughs> uh, 
anything pretty much is better than having your language uh, automatically generate your code automatically generated by a machine uh, because debugging is just is just horrible at that point um, and debugging is what coders do more than pretty much anything else so. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more opinions but we do have time for one more question Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, is the sorry is is the book going to be in rough cuts? Uh, yes, in, a, so, in, it's in likely soon or yes, probably within a month. I'd have thought. Fantastic. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. <laughs>